the 22nd of December 2021. So the training, this practice, the training of the mind, is something that is quite difficult to do. Because it's the nature of our minds that if we have let them go, as we have, to follow all their moods and sense impressions for a long time, then that's what they'll habitually do. And so we've done that for many becomings, many births and many worlds already. And so these minds, they're always running after these sense impressions, always following after these sense impressions, attaching to them. If we are pleased by them, then we attach to them. If we're displeased, then we attach to them. And this is a world, this is a birth, this is becoming. And so this is what pulls us through the cycle, is ignorance. And then this goes on to uh, sense consciousness, and physicality, mentality, and then contact and feeling, and craving, attachment, becoming and birth, and completes the whole cycle. So we really need to be very cautious and and careful of these hearts of ours. Need to always be teaching our own minds. Need to be cautioning, reminding ourselves. Because the Buddha said that the Tathagata himself is just the one who tells us. He tells us, shows us this path to freedom from suffering, but we need to do that. We need to put that into action ourselves. So it's like the Buddha is the owner of a fruit orchard. And all we have to do is walk into that orchard, pick a fruit and eat it. And it's not something that's difficult to do. But the person who had to plant that orchard, it's very difficult for them. And so for the Buddha to meet with this path, it's very difficult for him to find that. And he had to sacrifice his flesh, his blood, for many, many lives. And all we have to do is walk this path of practice, just put in some effort into our meditation, and be sincere in our efforts as well. So we have this firm sincerity in samadhi, developing samadhi, firm sincerity in keeping the standards and the schedule of the monastery, And so for monks, we need to have that firm sincerity. Because as monastics, we are those who have thrown away and given up all of the happiness in the world already in order to really focus on this practice through a desire to gain an understanding in the Dhamma, to receive the Dhamma. So um, maybe that desire... To see the Dhamma is um, on the level of a sotapanna, one who has fallen into the stream of Nibbāna, the stream of the Dhamma. And so what that means is that they're not able to fall to any lower state, any of these realms of woe. But that isn't referring to the body. It's not that when we die, then uh, that physical death, then we don't fall but it's more referring to feelings within the mind. The death um, of those feelings in the mind. And so those people who have realized stream entry, they seem the harm in all bad karma. They see that um, causing others harm, and this is something that they just don't want to do. And all they have the desire to do is meritorious things. And so these are people who have sacrificed, they're generous, and that's just their normal way of being. And so they're sacrificed, they're generous, and they abandon this sense of self. And they might have really full energy um, in creating goodness. And so some people really do have a lot of this, this internal energy, a lot of enthusiasm. 
In the Buddha's time, for example, there's Ananda Pindika and Lady Visaka, and they had great energy in creating goodness. Well, there's uh, Lady Malika, who had this great energy as well to practice. And even though she lost all her children and her husband at the same time, and she wasn't given into sorrow over that because she already saw the nature of change, its nature of inconstancy. And so the things that we have right now, they may be very valuable and we may have had to have spent a lot of money and spent a lot of time finding that money to get those things. And so when we obtain them, then there's happiness there. But it's not a genuine happiness. And this is something we need to be very cautious about, very careful over. Because if those things get stolen, if they break or if they just... <clears throat> decay and following the course of nature, then suffering arises. And so these things, they don't bring us to freedom from suffering. Even though we get those things, they don't bring us away from suffering. And so we need then to practice, we really do need to practice, in order to bring our views to be good views, to be correct views. So meditation or bhavana, this means development, bringing about development, progress, the development of the mind, making it better. And if we don't do that, then the mind will always be following after these sense impressions and always be um, getting into suffering. And so people who have children, for example, they can experience a lot of suffering due to that. When they first have a child, then they're happy. But if they get separated from that child, then there can be great anguish. And separated, the child separated from their father, from their mother, from their brothers, from their sisters. And there's a lot of sorrow, a lot of despair due to that. But this is just the nature of conditioned. This is just how they are. They're things that don't last. They're things that are not sure. And we want to be together for a long time. This is something that's difficult to achieve and depends upon the merits that we've created in the past. So if we don't have Dhamma, then our minds just won't be freed from suffering. We may have many things in this world. We may have just a few things. But in either case, we attach to whatever we have. So we should practice to train our minds well, to train them for ourselves, and to do this each day. Always developing, always cultivating our minds. So for the monks, need to sacrifice, need to go to the chanting, really need to be intent on the practice. Intent on keeping up the ascetic practices, eating just one time a day or eating all the food in a bowl. And um, to have that sense of restraint and caution. Waking up at 4 a.m. instead of just sleeping at ease. Um, going to the chanting, not indulging in that pleasure of sleep. We don't find joy or fun from eating. Um, and by doing this, what we're doing is gathering together the energy in our minds. And whatever we do, and we try to always have mindfulness there. And so we've already sacrificed many things already to come into the rope. And so what meaning does that have? And what is it that we're after? Because we don't want anything in the world anymore. We don't want to just get more and more things like many other people do. But what we're after is the Dhamma. And to get the Dhamma, what that means is sacrificing, giving up the things that we're attached to. We should look, whatever it is that we're attached to, then we should work to sacrifice that attachment. And so what is it that we get attached to? It's physical things, it's mental things. And when we take possession over those, then we worry about them. 
And so suffering appears in the mind. So therefore we need to have effort in our practice to be abandoning bad karma, to be developing goodness and merit, and to be making the mind pure. And this is the very heart of Buddhism. So the bad karma through our body, through our speech, we know about that already and we try to give that up. But there's also that bad karma within the heart, the thinking, the proliferating in a way which is unskillful. So if we attach to that, then that becomes bad karma. And there's also goodness. But even goodness, if we attach to that, it becomes the cause for suffering just the same. So the feelings that arise within the heart, <clears throat> we need to know those. And sometimes we do a lot of goodness. And we can keep the precepts, we can make a lot of merit, and we can do this to really quite an amazing level. But there may be some conceit that arises within us over that. And we have to understand that that's just something normal. This ditti mana. And uh, what that means, ditti is view, and mana is the sense of um, kind of holding or attaching, a sense of conceit. And so it's normal for us to have these things. Initially we need to have them. And we may consider ourselves to be better than others or lower than them or the same as them. And if we attach to that, then we think that that's actually something real. And so this is conceit appearing within the heart. And so sometimes we may be on the same level as others. But if we attach to that as being on the same level, then that's conceit. Or at other times we may be equal, but we think that we're higher or lower, and that too is conceit. And sometimes people do a lot of goodness and they think that I'm better than others. And really they, they are better, or maybe they think that they're equal or lower, but this too is conceit. And so we should know that this is just one kind of Dhamma, a phenomena that's appearing within the heart. So there are also skillful dhammas as well, such as mindfulness, such as joy, happiness. And these two are dhammas. These are meritorious forms of dhamma. And there's also the dhammas of kilesa, of the defilements. But these kilesas, they're not really ours. They don't really belong to other people either. They're just a formation of nature that arise, stay for a while and cease. And they don't belong to anyone. But we take possession over them. We see them in terms of self as being mine or belonging to others, my kilesas or their kilesas. But really we should view them as just being dhamma. And that really we don't have them, we don't own them. The kilesas, they're just nature. And the marga, this path, it's also dhamma as well, but a skillful form of dhamma. It's a... Um, phenomena which we rely upon first, initially. And we develop this, these skillful dhammas, in order to defeat the unskillful dhammas, until the wisdom which allows us to let go arises. So the word for monk in Thai, pra, uh, what this comes from in Pali is the word vara, which means you know, venerable, and something that's very good and high. And so when we come to ordain as monks, we have this intention to practice. And oftentimes, the lay people, um, they'll ask how many monks are staying in the monastery. And so they're not referring to Buddha images. What they're referring to is the monastics there. And so many lay people, they ask this question, how many monks are there? And we may answer, there's 45 or 50, and they say, oh, that's a lot. But we don't tell them how many of the monks actually go to the chanting. And how many monks are really intent on keeping the standards of the monastery. 
And if we gave an answer to that, it would be less than the first answer. But for us, during this time, we really set our hearts well um, on uh, keeping these standards, on this practice. And I rejoice in that goodness. And so having ordained, we don't wish to find any kind of happiness in the world. We're not seeking that happiness, but rather what we're doing is setting our hearts on studying and knowing matters of happiness and sadness so that we can see the Dhamma. So we should contemplate all things that arise and see how they stay for a while and then they cease. And so sometimes we get to know these things through our study of the scriptures, but we don't yet actually see them. And when these sense impressions arise and we know them, then the heart just attaches to them and gives a meaning of self to them and then they're suffering. So when I was staying with Venerable Ajahn Chah, um, he gave a teaching about doubt. And he said, well, there's no point in getting involved in doubt because it's just something that arises and ceases. And I thought to myself, well, is that all there is to it? I had some kind of understanding, but it wasn't a really clear understanding into that teaching. But really that's all there is to be freed from suffering. Any happiness, any sadness that comes up, we see that just arise and cease. Any anger, any scatteredness of mind, we just know that in time. And the mind's on top of those things. And then the mind feels at ease. There's no suffering that comes up. But we don't see that happening because we don't have a clear understanding of things. But if we understand the Dhamma, then there's great joy and happiness. Like understanding the nature of the body. Initially we see it as being something beautiful, but this is something that we should really contemplate and consider. And when we can perceive the body as being unattractive, then the heart fills up with happiness, with joy. And it's a different kind of happiness. It's the happiness that comes from seeing truth. A change of the way that we see things. Before it was deluded, but now we're seeing reality. Before we saw things in terms of me and mine. And that's due to the distortions in the perceptions of the mind. And that's just how things are like for the average person in the world. But if we contemplate these things every day, and then we'll get to see them for ourselves. We can ask ourselves, well, why do we think that these bodies are beautiful? What's so attractive about them? Is hair beautiful? Is skin beautiful? And if they are, why do we need to clean them every day? Why do we need to bathe? And so we think things through in this way. Like the robes or the clothes that we wear, we need to clean them every day. Initially, they were clean already, but as we put them into contact with this body, then they become dirty because of the fat, because of the sweat of the body. And eventually they become something disgusting as well. So we contemplate like this. These clothes, they're just elements. This body, just elements. Initially, uh, the clothes weren't disgusting, but when they come into contact with the body, um, then they become unclean. So it shows that the body is something unclean. And this is just looking at the outside of the body. But if we look inside it, then we'll see that very clearly. Like if we peel off the skin, then there's just flesh and blood, and the whole body is red, and there's no beauty to it at all. And the reason that we see beauty to these bodies is because we can only see the outside of them. And defilements come along and tell us that they're beautiful or that they're not beautiful. But this is just proliferation. But if we see things in the middle way, and then we'll see them as just being nature, as just being elements. 
we contemplate that we can gain a clear understanding of this, and then the heart fills up with happiness, with joy, and we gain great energy um, in our minds from seeing the nature of the body and seeing it as just being elements. If we can see that, then we see the Dhamma. So may you set your hearts on this, on training in this way, because we've already set our goals, we already have our sights set. Really, what is it that we want? What are we after? We're not after the things of this world. But what we're after is the Dhamma. And the Dhamma, it exists on the shores of death. And if we half-heartedly practice in a frivolous way, then there's no way we're going to get there. And so if we... um, If we like certain food items, and we should eat just a small amount of them. The things that we don't like, then we eat a lot of them. The things that we're indifferent to, we can just take a medium amount of them. And so we should really set our mindfulness and our truthfulness before we take the food. And so the same applies for sleep as well. If we want to sleep a lot, then just sleep a little. If we want to speak a lot, then just speak a little and be training the mind like this. And so when we train the mind in this way, um, then samadhi will arise. And when that happens, then there won't be so much concern about food, about sleep. So we should be intent and focus on training ourselves in samadhi and take this as um, a main task of ours. So some monks ordain at quite an old age, and they really use their time well. They use that to do walking meditation, sitting meditation, and they feel at ease. And they're using their time in a way that's very valuable. As the days and nights, they're constantly passing by. And if we don't practice, then it's just that. It's just days and nights falling away, just time passing away. So may you set your hearts on this practice. And the happiness that we gain from the Dhamma, it's um, something that we can gain, and something that's really amazing. For myself, when I was practicing, I was two or three years as a monk, and there was um, a lot of joy and happiness that would come up very consistently for me. But when I reached four years as a monk, then it was amazing that this, this rapture and happiness would stay for months at a time. And so I'd carry on practicing, really focused on that, really seeking out this practice. In the beginning, it's something that's quite difficult. Uh, but when our heart gains, oh, sorry, um, I was carrying on seeking out the Dhamma. And then when I began to be able to defeat the defilements, then there was great energy of heart that came up. And the heart met with emptiness then. And so when it gets to that point, then we could begin to see clearly. And this walking and sitting meditation is something that just happens by itself. We don't need to tell ourselves to do it. The mind just tells itself, it happens automatically. So we need to get to this point in our practice. But in the beginning, we just focus on doing the morning chanting, the evening chanting, doing our duties and sacrificing, going in arms round and doing this without fail. And if we can do that, then that's already very good. So just carry on doing this without stopping. And then one day samadhi will arise. And when samadhi comes up, then the practice progresses very quickly. So may you set your hearts in this way. And if you do, then you will see the Dhamma.